welcome to Teacher and Zion Podcast. Hi, this is Doug Hatton, Teacher and Zion Podcast. And not too long ago, I did a three-part series on this podcast called Is Priesthood Even a Thing? And fully expecting that uh, I would become an outcast, um, I was surprised to find a, a mostly positive response. Those videos became by and far the most popular videos I've done. Now, the purpose of this video is in no way to capitalize on the success of those videos. Um, I genuinely feel like that series is fairly thorough. However, since putting out those videos, I've had quite a few conversations on that topic with folks. Uh, and while the responses I say have been mostly positive, I know that there are those who, uh, who do think that I'm deceived. Um, and it has raised an alarm with a couple of people in the uh, church organization that I've been a member of since I was about 18 years of age. But as time passes and I continue to receive additional insight by way of the spirit uh, and because of that and, and because of discussions that I've had with uh, numerous people, I began to realize that I may need to briefly touch on this topic again for the for the sake of greater clarity. Um, first of all, especially for those of, of you that uh, are upset at me right now or <clears throat> have shared that you are uh, not happy with the things that I have said about priesthood, I feel it is important to note, and uh, I really can't emphasize this enough, that I did not pursue this line of questioning with the Lord. On the contrary, it was rather the Lord who pursued it with me uh, beginning about three years ago. And because of the nature of the covenant that I've made with the Lord uh, so many years ago, he understands that uh, I am willing to follow him wherever he leads, and no matter how uncomfortable it may be or however unpopular it makes me. And secondly, I also want to say that uh, none of this, and, and again, this is something I really cannot emphasize enough, but none of what I've shared about it, about the priesthood, is about taking something away from those men who believe that they hold priesthood or the various keys as outlined in the Doctrine and Covenants. It's actually about giving you something much greater. The Lord's offering something much greater. He's offering it to me. He's just offering it to you. Something which the church has been sorely missing. And that is the true priesthood. The priesthood that was given under the terms of the new covenant. And so if you would give me just a little time, I will expound on that a little further. But about three years ago, the Holy Spirit spoke to me with his still small voice, which I've become very familiar with over the, over the years, over time. And he told me that there was a problem with our understanding about priesthood. And this was completely out of the blue. I wasn't even thinking about this topic. I was attending a church service and a friend of mine was uh, speaking, doing a sermon and, uh, and suddenly I heard his voice speak this and it didn't even have anything to do with the sermon that was being spoken. And that began a three year journey for me, one where God was gracious enough to give me the space and time I needed to process the things he was trying to show me. And, and so therefore I, I extend that same grace to others. The truth that he ultimately revealed was so very far away though from anything that I might have expected. Therefore, he did have to patiently work with me. Um, he had to challenge my understanding and reorient my mind uh, in order to prepare me to receive the fuller revelation. And before I, I go too much further, I would like to address the reason why I titled that series, Is Priesthood Even a Thing? Um, yes, 
it's a provocative title. But I don't steer away from something controversial just for the sake of not being controversial. I use that title for a reason. Toward the end of the three-year process, God began to produce other witnesses regarding our erroneous beliefs about the priesthood. Um, this was completely unsolicited on my part. These witnesses were completely independent from me, uh, sometimes coming from people I didn't even know. And it was becoming obvious to me that the Lord was now preparing the way for a major correction. One, I believe, that would be necessary in order to pave the way for a true and lasting spiritual revival among his people. And I believe it is a part of how he is setting his hand a, a second time to recover us. Isaiah 11.11 11. I believe this will be an ushering in of a, a great awakening. And it is an ushering in of a great and marvelous work. The coming forth of the Book of Mormon was to herald this great and marvelous work. But I believe that was placed on hold while men sought to uh, exhaust their own ways, rely upon their own wisdom, and run down every possible corridor until, at long last, a new generation begins to discern the differences between the good wheat of the Book of Mormon and the tares that Satan planted early in the history of the church. Realizing that the ways of man and their earthly institutions must pass away. Not unlike that whole generation of Israel that had to first pass away before Israel could enter into the promised land. This isn't about age, however, but about a condition of the heart. Even some of us who were previously steeped in the traditions of men and in the institutional church can become, even as Caleb and Joshua, and uh, lead the way, championing the cause for the next generation. God is uh, seeking those whose hearts are as new wineskin, that we may receive the new wine of the truth of Jesus that sets us free. I praise God that we are now seeing people awaken to a sense of their awful condition, the, the awful spiritual condition of the church, and realizing that they've been lied to. This is a mighty move of God to cause us to recognize that simply being a member in good standing in an institution that claims to be the exclusive club with all the authority and the keys will not save you. You can be in perfect standing with men and with the church institution and not even know God. Paying your tithe and spending your time uh, and effort busily performing various works for the church or in the temple does not guarantee you necessarily the life-giving relationship with the Savior, whom the Book of Mormon says is not only the Son, but the very Eternal Father, the God of Israel, and the one who created us. We are now waking up to the fact that we had a form of godliness, outwardly performing various ordinances, but inadvertently denying the power thereof. Or in other words, we have believed or pretended perhaps to have authority, uh, imagined that we have keys, and therefore thought that we were doing the will of God. But in fact, we have uh, unknowingly abandoned the pure gospel of Jesus Christ and the only true doctrine of the Lamb. We have been busily engaged in many dead works, trying to convert others to an institution. And when we tell the people the story of our church, um, it begins with Joseph Smith. When we make him the founder of our religion, rather than Christ, then that means Joseph is our foundation. The power of heaven 
the very signs that Jesus said would be among his believers are not in the churches as that should be. And neither do those who profess to hold authority and keys walk in the power that they should. This is a measuring stick. It's very simple. The only blessings we find are among those who are truly humble and despite the many errors taught to them, have learned to hear from the spirit. But even then, the blessings are more of a trickle. Nowhere near the level that we see Jesus doing in the scriptures. And yet, did he not say, and greater works would we do than what we saw him doing? Even good and honorable men, through no fault of their own, are held back from their full potential because of the lies that we have been told. The more the Holy Spirit spoke to me about this topic of priesthood, the, the more others began to share and the more witnesses that God brought forth. As I started to piece everything together, contemplating the fuller meaning of, of what God was trying to reveal, there, there came a day where I simply threw up my hands and I exclaimed out loud in the middle of my living room and in front of my wife, is priesthood even a thing? It was a moment of shocking revelation to me because I had just said the unthinkable and surely this wasn't what the Lord was trying to reveal. And yet in that moment, instead of a correction or a rebuke, instead of the spirit withdrawing, instead of confusion, there came an immediate clarity and confirmation that began to settle upon me like the, like the rising sun. And once that piece of the puzzle clicked into place, all the other facts about church history, along with what we read in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon, and the changes that were made to the early revelations finally made sense. They all came together. Instead of this knowledge causing me to lose my faith, I found my faith renewed and strengthened. I found the Book of Mormon itself becoming fully vindicated, standing forth as a record that God brought forth to correct our errors, but which sadly quickly began to be buried under an avalanche of new teachings and understandings and revelations that were birthed as a result of those new teachings or understandings some of which stand in actual opposition to the teachings in the Book of Mormon. Depending on whether the saints understood and adhered to the truths contained within that record would seal our fate as a people. But we can still repent. At first, I felt a great reluctance to put out those videos asking God if this shouldn't be delayed but the Holy Spirit seemed to press into it all the more, telling me that now was the time. Weeks later, as I was writing the monologue uh, that I would record for those videos, I had a, a moment of doubt, uh, not really about the information and whether it was correct, but whether I should make it public for, for all to hear. I also uh, second guessed the timing once more, Within my mind, the thought came to me, though, if not now, when? Time is growing short. And at that very same moment, an email notification went off on my phone. I opened the email and read it. It was a listener of the podcast, and the title of the email was something to the effect, Question About Priesthood. And when I read the email, they were explaining how they were examining some of the very things that I had been contemplating over the last few years. And then they wrote, I am beginning to wonder if priesthood is even a thing. Here was the very words that I had uttered some weeks previously. What they shared in that email was yet another witness. Looking around, I could see that the very things 
other truth seekers in the restoration were grappling with at this very time. The things that other podcasts were exploring were rapidly becoming a cloud of witnesses attesting to the fact that the time for this truth to come forward was now. And now I'm going to insert something here that I wasn't planning to share, but I had a spiritual dream a couple of years ago, and I'm sure this dream may offend some, but this is the dream that I was given. And that dream broke my heart and it showed me the heart of God towards the restoration people. And I believe it's connected with what we're talking about. And it's very much connected with the time that we're in and with the condition of the church and where we need to go as a people. So in this dream, I was in a large church. Uh, they were not restorationists. I want to make that clear. These are not restorationists. So I'm in some church, but they were filled with the Holy Ghost. In retrospect, I believe this might have been a foreshadowing of the idea that God could choose another people. And they had the gifts and the blessings that we should be walking in. And these weren't false gifts or false tongues or whatever, as we often see in, in some of the churches. And I was sitting in that congregation, uh, left of center stage and probably a, a dozen or, or so rows back. And uh, the pastor up front was just filled with the spirit. I could feel it. And I also knew that he walked in many of the gifts of the spirit but especially in the prophetic gifts. As I sat there listening to him speak, he stopped and he looked up as if to heaven. And I knew right then that God was talking to him. And I watched as tears began to fill his eyes. And I thought, what profound thing has the Lord shared with him? And then he nodded as if saying yes to the Lord or acknowledging and he lowered his head and then he looked directly into my eyes. I knew the Lord had given him instruction regarding me. And then pointing to me, he spoke as if speaking to the entire congregation. And he said, place him in charge of the storage units. It seemed to be some kind of answer to prayer. The dream ended. And over the coming weeks, I had asked many people what they felt the dream might indicate. I knew it was from God, but I did not yet have an interpretation. And I'm going to be honest with you, anyone with a restoration background uh, that I spoke to tended to believe that it was something about the storehouse. And that was the first thing my mind went to as well, you know, possibly having to do with some work of bishop or something that maybe I would be involved with. But as I prayed about it, it did not seem right. That was not the answer. And, uh, and so I, I thought it was unusual because, you know, quite often the Lord will give me interpretation. Um, but for some reason I, I had to search this one out. So maybe there was a block or something that I wasn't ready to see yet. And finally, while worshiping in a home filled with non restoration believers, uh, it was a worship that we were invited to, um, and no one there knew in any way, shape, or form about any of my Mormon connections. Uh, they assumed we were just Christians. They didn't know we believed the Book of Mormon, and I felt led to share my dream. And there was a woman in this group whom the Spirit of God had revealed to me had a prophetic gift. And upon hearing the dream, she told me that storage units are a place where someone stores something until they can bring it back into the household. People don't store trash or worthless items because it costs money to store this. Generally speaking, there are items that they desire to keep, but they have no place for yet 
in the dwelling place where they are at. As she spoke these words, I knew the Lord had given her a word that these were not her own thoughts. And so I was paying close attention. And then she said, this dream is not about stuff. It's not about items. It's about people. There are people in these storage units. And the moment she said this, the Holy Spirit confirmed the truth of it to me. And my heart fell. I felt a great anguish for the people of the restoration of whom I count myself a part of. I knew God loved them and he did not want to abandon them, but rather preserve them for a time when he can once more bring them into the household of God. And as a parallel scripture, I guess I would look at Book of Mormon, where it says that if the Gentiles will repent, they will be numbered among the house of Israel. But I felt a great sadness in that moment because I knew it was true. Now, in no way do I believe, not even for one second, that this dream means I am the leader of or to be in charge of all the restoration people everywhere. What I do believe is that this shows that um, this is a very important part of my ministry. And that that ministry is not exclusive to me, but there may be many who are being called to care for the various storage units. And I'm just one of many. And previous to this dream, I had tried my best to walk away from the restoration. I wanted to go out and get away from the religious people. I was tired of the rejection. I was tired of dead religion. And I just wanted to go out and I wanted to preach the gospel to the lost, to those who did not know Jesus. And I tried. I tried as hard as I could. And the Holy Spirit was not with me in that. Um, he let me know he had people doing that. And I'm like, why? Why? What is the point to all this? I tried to flee this responsibility, um, but the Lord prepared a whale to swallow me up. And I repented and I agreed to minister to those whom he wanted me to minister to. Even though in my heart, I probably complained. You know, I, I didn't want to minister to the religious you know, one day I was just telling the Lord, I just want to minister to the lost. I want to minister to those who don't even know Jesus. And his spirit said, exactly. I know I'm not above anyone. I have simply awakened to a sense of our awful condition, me included. And I recognize our need to flee dead religion and run to Jesus. I'm trying to do that now. I haven't achieved. I haven't reached the goal. I'm trying to climb the mountain like we all are. I'm sharing the interpretation of this dream after having kept it quiet for so long because I want you to understand how serious this is. We as claimants of being the one true church with the only authority and keys, but exhibiting no evidence for this and having no real power and yet effectively standing in judgment of all the other churches and therefore receiving the greater condemnation because of that same judgment being leveled back against us. And because of that, we are no longer in the household of God. And I'm speaking collectively of the restoration and not to individuals. We each have our own relationship with the Lord. But speaking collectively to the restoration, we are in the storage units. And there was a lot of different storage units. Just like there's a lot of different little 
pieces of the restoration, all these individual congregations and all these different organizations of the restoration and all the different breakoffs and RLDS, LDS, Temple Lot. Some of them were bigger storage units and some were smaller. But we are in these storage units until we awaken to a sense of our awful condition and repent so that we can literally come out of her, my people, and be gathered into the true household of God. Brothers and sisters, this is the time for this truth to come forward so that the lies that have held us back can be eliminated. It's not just that we need to believe harder or muster up greater faith or more fully pay our tithes or keep the Sabbath day holy or keep the word of wisdom. You know, it's not on you, brothers and sisters, that we don't yet have Zion. For people who have come out of the RLDS background in particular, we've had so much condemnation and guilt tossed our way for not yet having Zion. But our problem isn't that we need to do more things for the church or give more of our money to the church or show up to church more often or somehow love one another more while at the same time our spiritual leaders attack other restorationists other groups other congregations other churches labeling them as apostates for either doing something or not doing something exactly as they think it should be done or simply believing a little differently Many in the priesthood have effectively spearheaded the effort to keep us divided while preaching that we need to be unified. Mission impossible. However, I'm not laying the blame for this entirely upon the priesthood because many of them are just as confused as the rest of us. They've inherited the same lies and traditions that are keeping us running around in endless circles. So throw off the lies that you've been told. The church must first be judged and purified. Let everything that can be shaken be shaken. Cling to the plain and precious truths found in the Book of Mormon. Forsake the errors you have been taught and read the Bible and the Book of Mormon as if for the first time. Asking the Holy Spirit to help you really see what it is saying rather than letting the traditions of the church and latter-day revelations, some of which may be an error, interpret those words in the Book of Mormon for you, clouding your understanding. Every one of us will be challenged in the coming days. Our faith will be tested. We must hold to that which is right and jettison the rest, or we will be hopelessly lost and without power and authority to meet the challenge. Yes, there are those who will resist what God is doing, especially some in leadership positions. This has always been the case. Every time new truth has been revealed or errors challenged, some will resist the truth, even with great anger and animosity. Remember our fight is not with them. They aren't the enemy. We must learn how to love them. For we fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers of wickedness in the heavenlies. If we want to be a part of the kingdom of Christ, we will need God's help to show us how to rejoice when we are persecuted and thrown out of our communities and places of worship. We will need to learn how to love our fellow man and show compassion even for those who judge us and say or do hurtful things. It is because of the many conversations that I've had since the release of that series on the priesthood that I began to realize there was a need to revisit it, not to rehash everything uh, previously shared, but attempt to bring greater clarity, even as I myself continue to receive greater clarity. As I listen to what others have received and understood, as I hear from those who don't understand and cannot accept what I've shared. The Holy Spirit continues to refine my perspective. And so when someone confronts me about how I no longer believe in the priesthood, 
the first thing I tell them is, I believe that God calls certain individuals to serve the body in various offices of ministry, whether it's an elder or a priest or a teacher, and that within a group of believers, if they receive revelation to that effect and have accepted the calling as being from God, that they can set that individual apart and consecrate them for the work through an act of ordination. After all, we see this in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon, which I have argued at length, are the two records that God has established for us to rely on, along with the Holy Spirit, as guidance both for ourselves and for the church. And that church being defined as a spiritual entity, not an institution. It is quite simply all those people everywhere who meet the criteria as outlined by Jesus himself. The membership of his church knows no denominational boundaries. What I now tell anyone who would challenge me on why I no longer believe in the priesthood is that I do believe in the priesthood. I just don't believe in the priesthood as we've been taught in the restoration. And I will explain more in just a moment. As I said, I believe men are called and set aside for the work of the ministry, the purpose of which is to build up or teach and equip the saints so that they can also minister and walk in the gifts of the spirit and walk in spiritual authority and come up to the full measure of Christ. I know this is confusing for some of you, but hear me out. God is not the author of confusion. Satan is. And because of this, you might say, Doug, um, I'm confused by what you're saying. Therefore, I feel I should reject it. Now, listen to me carefully. Many times when Jesus or his disciples or even the prophets themselves shared truth, people were confused. They often rejected their teachings, even though they were true, because they did not make sense when measuring those truths against the traditions that they had been previously taught. And there's where confusion comes in. And this is how Satan gets us. When Jesus said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. He lost every one of his disciples that day, except for the 12. So that was at least 70 people or more. And even the 12 were confused and did not yet understand. And Satan has got many of you right now confused because of the lies and the traditions that you've been taught. Traditions which are not supported by the Bible or the Book of Mormon. Not only are they not supported, but in many cases, they stand in complete opposition to them. And I cannot say it any more plainer than that. As I explained in the priesthood series, the question I put to God was, is this just about the use of the word? priesthood? Is it just the word that is the issue here? And the answer came immediately with the words being impressed upon me. Is that true? Is it just a word? Immediately I knew better. As I thought it through, as I previously stated, there is a lot of baggage attached to that word. But to be perfectly blunt, that baggage includes some very powerful and sinisterly deceptive connotations that we have unwittingly and unknowingly inherited. In fact, some are quite literally, I believe, satanic in nature, opposing the work done by Jesus and an affront to the cross. As scandalous as that sounds, this is where we can appreciate the awesome nature of God's grace and his love towards us. More on that in just a moment. Soon after the concept of the restoration of the priesthood was invented in the early church at the behest of Signe Rignan and co-opted, I believe, by Satan himself to bury the truths contained in the Book of Mormon and undermine the new covenant, the entire church came under condemnation. Whether or not that revelation stating this was corrupted by men and it surely was. The entire church had, even before this, begun to suffer one disaster after another. And these disasters were often of their own making, 
but some of them appeared to be nothing less than God himself standing in opposition to their efforts, which were now out of sync with his work, the work that he had called them to. And this is called sin. And they suffered the consequences for those sins. The greatest of those sins was presumption. And because of the sins of a few, many innocent people suffered and some died. Again, the persecution that the church suffered, some of it was unwarranted, but not all of it was entirely because of their distinctive beliefs. Some of it, I would argue, came as a direct result of the errors that crept into the church and the errors committed by its leadership. And because of these errors and the failure to properly repent, they suffered much misery that they could otherwise have avoided. Now hindsight is 2020, and we can benefit by learning from their mistakes, or we can turn a blind eye to them and continue in those errors. Joseph Smith and others did not get the benefit of being able to look back and have time to assess the history of the church, to look at where others had failed before them and avoid those traps. Instead, they were living it out in real time, actually making history as it unfolded. And unfortunately, the one thing that could have saved them a lot of trouble, the Book of Mormon, quickly began to play second fiddle and fell away as being the primary instructor on how they should go. It is not lost on me that they were spiritual pioneers, and pioneers will suffer many things. But when mistakes are made, that suffering is greatly increased and can become a matter of life and death. Most of them were young men, and not many of them were wise. The condemnation placed upon the institutional church was not just for treating lightly the Book of Mormon, but first and foremost, they stood condemned for treating lightly the New Covenant. Let those with ears hear. Joseph knew this. The Lord had revealed it to him. But through the efforts of Sidney Rigdon, I'm sure, and others, the blame for this was likely placed upon others. And as they worked on this revelation and added to it, as it turns out, over a period of days, that's how long it took to come up with this full revelation, as we have it in the Doctrine and Covenants, they ended up with a document that not only reaffirmed their errors regarding the priesthood, but further added to it. Now, this is important. These two topics, the new covenant and the concept of priesthood that we ended up with are very much related in terms of revealing where the institutional church went awry. I say this because our concept of priesthood as laid out in the doctrine and covenants cannot actually exist under the terms of the new covenant. I cannot say it more plainly than that. Either we adhere to the new covenant or we adhere to our beliefs about priesthood. Now, getting back to the awesome nature of the grace of God, generations have been born and passed away since this condemnation. But since the Book of Mormon very plainly reveals that God does not hold children accountable for the sins of their fathers, and some of the grosser sins that were introduced into the church have since been repented of or have faded into history, God has met us right where we're at. He has taken into account the degree of deception we currently labor under through no fault of our own being passed on to us. Many good and honorable men have sought to serve God over the years and even now and have been called into ministry. And because of the traditions we inherited through a third book of scripture introduced as the law of the church, taking priority and preeminence over the Bible and the book of Mormon, such that the words contained in these two records designed to set us on the right path are now, even when we read them, often interpreted through the lens of this third book, which contains errors and outright lies from the adversary. In the LDS, there are additional writings which only compound those errors. And as a result, many faithful, and honorable men have labored for the Lord under the concept that they have held one of these two priesthoods, which Signe Rigdon, not God, introduced and convinced Joseph Smith of. 
Even so, God has honored the good desires of those men who sought to diligently and humbly labor for him on behalf of their fellow man. I praise God that he is not a legalistic and overly harsh Pharisee, but he judges us according to our situation. I'm thankful to God that he still loves us in spite of our errors. So long as those errors are honest ones done in ignorance and not intentionally, the blessings of God can and do still pour forth, though they may be somewhat limited. And this is one of the reasons why God's servants do not yet walk in the same power of Jesus and his disciples, much less be able to do greater works than these. For every truth and every correction, there is a season. I would argue that God, knowing the times in which we live, and what must shortly come upon the earth, in his tender mercy has seen fit to address this error. He begins to call upon prophets and teachers and ordinary people who are willing to serve as witnesses in order to begin to reveal that error and speak the truth that can set us free. I believe individuals are still called to serve in offices of ministry, but is that priesthood? Yes and no. Yes, if you recognize that every member of the church of the Lamb of God is a member of that priesthood, even the royal priesthood that Peter spoke of. Those called to a specific office of ministry are simply being asked to take a step down and become a humble servant in the household of God. That places you beneath the general membership of the church, not above it. It isn't that I don't believe in priesthood. I do. God isn't trying to take something away from us. Instead, he's trying to give us something far better, something far more beneficial and powerful. Will we be like the toddler that's holding on to an old rag doll that all the stuffing has come out of, which smells bad and and maybe has mold growing on it that makes us sick? Or will we let go of it and receive the replacement our Heavenly Father has for us, something which is far more beautiful and clean and won't make us sick? Hear me out. If you can lay hold of this truth and not let Satan steal it from you, but instead study it out and honestly and humbly ask of God, you will come to the realization that nothing is actually being taken from you, except maybe pride and error and a handicap. By letting go of this error, your ministry can become far more effective. There are indeed two priesthoods, which we can learn about from the two records that God gave us to correct our understanding and establish our doctrine. The first one was from the beginning. It is the only true priesthood that ever existed. You can learn about it in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon, and especially in the pages of Alma. These were men who were not only called, but also ordained by God himself. They were never ordained by men. Go read it for yourself. Alma speaks of this. They are forever high priests after the order of Melchizedek, also called priests after the order of the Son of God. This is an eternal priesthood with no beginning or end. The other priesthood, though, was a temporary priesthood. It had a very distinct beginning and a very distinct end. It began with the Levites and Aaron's lineage, with the law of Moses being connected to the tabernacle, and it ended with John the Baptist. The priesthood in the Bible was corrupted over time and rejected by God. This priesthood no longer exists under the terms of the new covenant. Now getting back to that high priesthood after the order of the Son of God, these were men, as Alma tells us, who were ordained by the hand of God. It is important we acknowledge what Alma tells us here, that these men were from the very beginning called forth and ordained by God to prepare men so that they would know in what manner to look 
to the coming of the Lamb of God. They were set up by Christ himself as a type and shadow of himself. These were men who had truly overcome the flesh by the power of Christ alone, so that they had no more desire to sin, being transformed into the image of Christ. They had experienced that mighty change in their heart that Alma speaks about. And although they were not perfect and could not claim to have never sinned, they became perfect and righteous through the merits of Christ. Therefore, they were not only a foreshadowing of Christ himself, but a foreshadowing of what every believer can ultimately become through Christ. They became a new creature in Christ even before Christ came. Therefore, they became an example for the rest of humanity. They became a symbol and taught mankind in what manner they should look for the coming of Jesus. The entire purpose, according to Alma, was this, to prepare people for when Christ would come into the world in the flesh and become their sin offering so that they could believe in him and in faith know from whence their salvation comes. And like a long shadow being cast on the ground, these priests were in the image of the one who cast it. But once the one who cast the shadow appears, we no longer look to the shadow, but we place our eyes squarely on him. He is the light. This is also what the Apostle Paul tells us about the law. Now that Christ has come, he fulfills that foreshadowing, and we no longer look to the law, but to the living word himself. And through him, all things are fulfilled, so long as he abides in us, and we abide in him. It's that simple. The last high priest in the Book of Mormon was Nephi. When Jesus came at last, he made Nephi one of his 12 disciples. The Book of Mormon later on tells us that the 12 that Jesus chose were elders in the church. That's right. As were the apostles. They also were elders, but a very specific kind of elder. They were elders who were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ and sent forth by him directly in person. The restoration is now headed for an apostolic confrontation, by the way. Those were the prophetic words given to a dear brother of mine, of which I have since received confirmation. And perhaps I can get him to discuss that with us and maybe some other things that we might all benefit. But Nephi ceased to walk in the office of the high priesthood because the job of foreshadowing the coming of Christ had been fulfilled. Now he would serve as an elder under the terms of the new covenant and as an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. And that is an end of any talk about priesthood or men who stand between God and man as the temple veil was torn in two. Never is the word priesthood or high priest ever mentioned ever again in the Book of Mormon, after Christ comes. In the Bible, we find the exact same thing. No mention of priesthood after Christ, except in Hebrews and in the writings of Peter, where they touch upon the change that occurred as a result of what Jesus did. And Jesus himself, while teaching, never mentioned the priesthood. Not even once in all of the New Testament, nor by his disciples. Now think about that. Not even in the Book of Mormon. The record that God specifically gave us to restore any plain and precious truths that may have been taken from the Bible. As comedian Bill Ingvall used to say, Here's your sign. If priesthood is all that we've been told that it is, as important as we have been told that it is, then it is surely a strange thing that Jesus never mentioned it, that his disciples never mentioned it. 
Now let's go back to the high priesthood after the order of the Son of God, because that priesthood alone is eternal. As I previously showed in the previous three videos, Alma is the only one who speaks of it in the Book of Mormon. This being a portion of the Book of Mormon, which is before Christ and under the Old Covenant. Now, if we can stop intentionally or unintentionally resting the words that he wrote, that Alma wrote, by interpreting them through the lens of the Doctrine and Covenants or the lens of the traditions of the church, we will begin to see what Alma is really saying and what he is not saying. The priesthood existed before Christ came in the flesh in order to point to Christ and his coming in the flesh to fulfill his mission and to die on the cross. These high priests were a type and shadow of Christ who would come and reconcile man to God. Once Christ came, he fulfilled the purpose of that high priesthood being a foreshadowing of what he would do. Jesus therefore becomes both the first and the last high priest, the one all previous high priests had pointed to the one that was from the very beginning. However, he accomplished what none of them could ever accomplish. So does that mean the priesthood ended? And here is the mystery. If you can get this down, I think you'll actually feel a release and a deliverance as the truth of it just permeates your soul. What did Christ tell us? If you abide in me and I abide in you, then you can do many good works. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Why? Because Jesus alone is the one who now holds the priesthood. Now that he has come, there is no need for men to stand in his stead or make intervention on behalf of his people. Having died on the cross, reconciling man to God, and having torn the veil of the temple, all we need now is to come unto him and receive what he has done and make covenant with him. He then ascended after the cross so that he could send the promise of the Holy Spirit to us. And what was the purpose of that gift? That gift is given by him to every person who makes a genuine covenant with God through Christ alone, and then enters into the waters of baptism as a witness of that covenant. Once we have the gift of the fire and the Holy Ghost, we have Christ in us. And here is the real meat of it. Having Christ in us means we have the one who is the great high priest, the one all the other priests after the order of the son of God had been pointing to dwelling in us. Think about the incredible gift that is the power of it cannot be overstated. Men, women, and even children who have made a covenant with him can carry that high priesthood within them. This doesn't mean, of course, that whatever you do is done with power and authority. Anything that we do on our own, because we think we ought to do it, is presumption. Jesus himself said he did nothing but what the Father showed him to do. Jesus is our example. He showed us the way. And now, if he abides in us, and if we look to him and we follow his lead, the promptings of the Holy Spirit, then we are his vessel. We are his temple. We are his body. Does that, is it coming together for you now, if it hasn't already, that we are the body of Christ? In other words, the Holy Spirit within us is the mind of Christ, and we are his body, his arms and his legs, his voice, his eyes, and we are to act as he moves upon us to act. The high priest, the great high priest, the one that all the other priesthood pointed to is now dwelling in us. And this is the mystery that the apostle Paul speaks of. The great mystery, he says, 
that it was not him that does the work, but Christ in him. And this is also the mystery that Peter is speaking about when he says that all of those believers who have made a covenant in and through Christ are now members of a royal priesthood. It is the reason why Jesus tells his disciples that these signs would follow those who believe the gospel and are baptized, not priesthood. They don't have to be apostles. You don't even have to have a title of any sort, but be a believer in Christ, make a covenant with him. And if you have him dwelling in you, his spirit, and he tells you what to do from moment to moment, then you have that priesthood dwelling in you, in him. And what more could you possibly ask for? Would you be willing to give up a title or the pretension of a priesthood no longer needed under the terms of the new covenant, which may even be an affront to the cross and everything that Jesus did for us and exchange it instead for the real power and authority of Christ, even the power and authority to heal the sick, cast out demons, prophesy and perform extraordinary miracles. When I first pondered what reactions I might get to that priesthood series, I had a difficult time believing that people would be willing to let go of Sidney Rigdon's idea of the priesthood, which was shoehorned into the church and part of our tradition now for 190 years. As I pondered the possible blowback, I heard the following words impressed into my mind. You can keep your priesthood if you stop oppressing the true priesthood I gave to all those who believe in me, that priesthood must now arise. And as I considered that the Holy spirit confirmed in my heart, what I, I realized deep down inside and knew that God already knew that that wasn't possible. God is proposing the impossible to us to see if we will be humble and recognize the truth that so long as we have something called the priesthood among us, which by its nature seeks to usurp or take the place of the only true priesthood under the terms of the new covenant, we are fooling ourselves. There must be a conflict, even as there is amity between the serpent and the seed of Eve. Even as the corrupt priests, scribes, and Pharisees were destined to confront Jesus and his disciples. Again, I do not mean to imply that all those who were ordained into an office of priesthood were evil or sinful or satanic. I was ordained a teacher. I was ordained an elder. I was ordained a, a 70. I know that God had called me to be a teacher. I heard his voice. God calls people into various ministries. I was not condemned because I believed something that I inherited. It was a tradition, the traditions of men. Many good and honorable men were born into a false tradition and they were forced to unknowingly work within a framework that God did not actually put in place. Even so, God has honored the good intentions of all those who were indeed honorable men who truly and humbly serve God. But now the time has come for us to set aside this error, set aside the errors of our ways, whatever they are, and stop playing church or pretend like being a member in good standing of the right institution or, or going to church every Sunday and singing hymns and paying tithes or or not drinking coffee or, or even simply by being a good person that somehow that will earn us salvation. That is religion and it is the work of a religious spirit. It is nothing but dead works and a lie of the devil. And when we come alive in Jesus and are transformed by him and our relationship with him, then we can have hope and joy and, true fulfillment. Many who were born into dead religion 
managed to find him anyway. They managed to find Jesus. I did simply by believing in him. And through him, we managed to find hope. Uh, we can find joy. We can find salvation in spite of our errors. And yet we have also still find that we are saddled with burdens and sins and errors and frustrations and sometimes depressions because let's be honest we're in the middle of a field and we're partaking of both wheat and tares we're partaking both of good food and also poison let us therefore be free of error and press into the truth it has a name even jesus Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Amen. Well, if I haven't completely offended you yet, I hope you will join us next time. And until then, God bless. <laughs>